Thank you very much, Barbara. So Andrew Kavolson, I've been advocating for IP rights for um, over 10 years now and um, been engaged with the ERB for a few as well, as well as the Free Market Roadshow. But the topic of today is going to be a global view of the protection and promotion of IP. But I want to talk more about the perception and realities of IP. So when we frame IP, we think, like, what sectors rely on it? What consumers use it? Um, so there's hard goods, of course. Um, those are examples of IP. I mean, there's shoes and clothes and those, those items that require trademark protection. There's tech. I mean, everyone's on their iPhones all the time, of course. Those are example of patents. Um, the life sciences, also example of patents for pharma, bio, life-saving drugs, and also the creative industry with copyright, moving recording industry. But who creates it? Who creates intellectual property? It happens on all different levels. Individuals, SMEs, large companies. Um, when we think about it, we're really a knowledge-based economy. We've moved beyond just producing goods, um, and protections are required to encourage that innovation. So we think about the facts of IP. Um, utility patents, 20 years from the initial filing of protection. Design patents, 12 years from the initial filing, and you're allowed to refile. Copyright, 70 years after the death of an author. And trademark, it's six years initially, but can be protected indefinitely. But what happens in innovation in IP? There's, there's a life cycle of it, and it happens very differently from copyrights and trademarks and patents at, at a much different pace. So uh, the, the first stage of the innovation life cycle is the creation uh, phase. So that can happen anywhere. It can happen on the back of a napkin. It can happen in a, in a lab. Um, the second phase is research and development. The third phase is production. Fourth is commercialization. Fifth is the distribution. And sixth is the consumer benefit. But as I mentioned, it, it happens very differently for copyrights, trademarks, and patents. For example, if we wanted to create a rap video here today, we could record it in 30 seconds, put it up on YouTube, and we could be famous by tonight. But that's not the same with the life sciences sector. I mean, it can take years, decades, to be able to come up with a patent for a life-saving drug. But there are some problems when you deal with perception versus reality, and there's, there's a false assumption of consumers. Um, if we look at the movie industry, when we see movies launch in the box office, we hear, you know, they raised a million dollars, or a hundred million dollars on opening uh, night of the movie. But what we don't hear is that it may have cost $500 million to make the movie. I think of it in terms of when you talk to a gambler, like how much did you win? They may have won $1,000, but it may have taken them $5,000 to be able to win it. So you don't always hear about how much it cost. Or when you deal with artists, uh, you always hear about artists going platinum. My favorite singer, Kid Rock, talks about going platinum. But you don't, you don't necessarily hear about how many years he spent trying to get there and all the errors that he made trying to get there before he became a success. Or when you deal with perception versus reality, with, with copyright online, I remember you know, over a decade ago when you could access songs and music online with Napster and Mega Upload, you just assumed because you could reach it on the internet that it was legal, or at least I did. Um, that's kind of a, a false assumption when you're dealing with perception <coughs> versus reality. Or with counterfeiting. So I went to order a pen recently. Uh, I like nice pens. And I went to Amazon and, and looked up a Mont Blanc. And it was significantly less than what the store Mont Blanc was selling it for. So I would assume if I go to Amazon, what I'm going to order is, isn't counterfeit. But I, I don't really know for sure. Um, and when we think about drug prices, uh, we only care about the out-of-pocket cost and just the cost to consumers. We don't really think about the research and development that goes into it. But there's billions of dollars that it takes to create one drug. Uh, it's been cited that $2.6 billion is what it takes to create a single life-saving drug. And it takes decades of years to develop that new drug. So I think there's also some misconceptions when people think about IP rights, specifically patents. <clears throat> when you get a patent, it's a trade-off between you and the government. You're agreeing to release your intellectual property after a set number of years in trading for protection of that. So people that are against patent protections, I often say, well, if it could exist in a trade secret, but that IP would never be released into the public. So it's really an arrangement between the government and the rights holder. I also think there's, there's kind of some confusion about the role of government. And 
if they're awarding rights or protecting rights. I mean, the government exists to be able to defend the protection of personal liberties and sovereignty. I don't think that the government should be involved with giving rights. In America, they made health care a right. So now they've made this right, but they don't make the drugs to be able to provide for health care. So they have to take it from companies. And how do they pay for it? They take it from taxpayers. When the government gets into being a business, it really creates market distortions and inefficiencies. If you look in the US, we have the United States Postal Service. And that's a government-run enterprise. And they're in debt. I mean, if you compare them with FedEx and UPS, they're just done much more efficiently in the private sector. Or if you look at state-owned enterprises like China, the objective of that is to maintain control. It isn't to innovate and to modernize. Uh, there's some assaults that are happening on intellectual property with compulsory licensing we're seeing in India and Brazil. Um, they're just taking the intellectual property for a short-term short gain. Um, or what we heard earlier on the International Pricing Index. The U.S. doesn't like what it has to pay for drugs, so it's doing it the quickest way they know how. They're looking at other countries, what they pay, and they're saying, we're only paying that amount. So those price controls are really an assault on IP. Other assaults on IP that are happening under the American Events Act in the U.S., they created something called PTAB. It's the Patent Trial Advisory Board. While it sounds good, this is an advisory board which to review patents to see if they're legitimate, what we're finding is that 90% of the patents reviewed by that board are being invalidated. Yep, I'll speed it up. So 90% of these patents are being overturned. We're seeing it in trade agreements as well. Like the quick fix is to be able to re reduce IP protections. But when I think about IP, I, I think about like a three-legged stool for copyrights, trademarks, and patents. So it's easy to attack one of those uh, legs, but when you attack one of those legs, it's really an attack on all of them. So, um, you know, we're seeing some good changes in IP. People are raising their profile. Trump is tweeting about it. Um, and I think that the U.S. is taking action on it. But what can we do here is continue to raise the awareness and, um, to Barbara's point earlier, band together for a consolidated <coughs> voice. And uh, that's the way we can really be heard. Thank you. Now, Cynthia. Five to ten minutes. Five to ten minutes. Let me briefly introduce Cynthia. Cynthia is with JTI, working out of Geneva. She is a, actually a lawyer. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Apologies. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Cynthia uh, uh, Ortiz Toledo is from Mexico originally, now living in uh, Geneva, working with JTI, uh, and uh, has been a lawyer and regulator in Mexico, and now views the other side of the fence, and will give us some um, ideas of how she views the issue of IP and brand protection and plain packaging, because this is also something that the European movement fights. Thank you, Barbara. Um, just to correct, oversight body of regulators, not regulators Sorry. themselves, which is a luxury position to have because we do get to tell regulators what they need to do, which is something quite interesting. So um, thank you again for the invitation. We're very happy to be here. Um, I don't want to go back to the point of why IP is so important because I know we have been discussing this since the morning. and. Also, you know, Andrew and I know Jared and everyone else is going to mention how important it is and why we need also some indexes to measure the importance and the contribution they have, not only for individuals, but also to the economies. So when we were talking about property rights, and I'm going to talk specifically about trademarks and brands, what happens when the government, instead of protecting those rights, is depriving you of them? What happens when the government, in terms of regulating actually infringes those IP rights that he was supposed to be um, protecting in the beginning. So I want to show you a small example of a, a regulation that it's um, very interesting. So, no, it's fine. This is a law initiative um, from the UK calling for plain packaging, a standardized font, size, color, text, specified graphics, photographs, clear and visible warnings. 
and of course, ban of misleading terms, ban of companies from advertising in a specialized journals, etc. Do you know which policy I'm talking about? So I imagine you think I'm talking about plain packaging for tobacco products. Oops. Actually, I'm not. This is another bill initiative that was proposed in 2016, and it's for infant formula. Calling for plain packaging for infant formula, as you can see, this Scottish MP looks very happy proposing this. Actually, it did pass the first reading. What happened is that, well, then uh, it was a UK general election, the parliament got dissolved in 2017, so it was not read further. But it got a good initiative, and if you look at it, and the provisions actually is the same thing that we have up with plain packaging for tobacco products. So looking now into plain packaging for tobacco products, this is what the reality is. Um, this is actually something that has been passed, and we're going to look in a second in the global scope of how this policy is looking, but basically, it's a ban on branding. Uh, trademarks, logos, non-prescribed colors are forbidden. We are only allowed to use this very ugly green color that they actually looked for to find which was the ugliest one they can find, and it, this, it turned out to be scientifically proved it's the ugliest one. So we don't have any rights to use brands or trademarks anymore. But you will think, this policy, what is the point of it? Because in the end, the countries that have introduced it, they already have many layers of different regulations in place, and actually this is just additional one. The objective was to reduce the smoking prevalence, and the results we have seen in the countries that have actually implemented it is that it was not achieved. They haven't succeeded to achieve that goal, and in turn has caused negative consequences, such as increasing illegal trade, uh, down trading, basically consumers being driven by price for their consumer choices, and then just choosing specific products, which of course the cheapest option is illegal trade. So we have seen the consequences of that. Um, how the world looks now, this is just a snapshot and is not a test on your knowledge of flags, but basically the idea here is to show all the countries that have implemented. So we have Australia, the first one in 2012, we have France, the UK, New Zealand, Ireland and Norway. Implemented then we have other countries that have adopted it, including Hungary, Slovenia, Georgia, Canada, Uruguay, Israel. Saudi Arabia, Thailand, Turkey, um, Congo, Brazil, and Singapore. And many others that have active proposals. That means that there is some law already in some certain parliamentary stage or bill going to some level of discussion in parliaments. And then discussions, which are all these different countries <coughs> that are looking into potentially adopting this policy. These discussions could be from mere considerations from a Minister of Health opinions, but basically the idea is already there. So what happens with this plain packaging policy? The reality is that it's not just a tobacco industry policy, and that's something that's very important to take emphasis on because it opens a window for further restrictions applied to other industry sectors as well. So Brand Finance, which is a company that is dedicated to doing valuation of brands, did a study of this. The reason for their interest in this was they have seen a number of different initiatives going forward uh, aiming for these policies. And we have seen lots of examples from Ontario Medical Association doing mock-ups of plain packaging on pizza boxes and cartons uh, uh, and food. Then we had Public Health England also report for alcohol uh, published in The Lancet also calling for plain packaging. The winner of the Brain Prize um, also calling for plain packaging to be applied for fatty salty foods. And of course, Australia leading the way on these policies as they did with plain packaging. Also, for the pharmaceutical sector as well, reducing tremendously the name of the brand in favor of generics. And one of the initiatives, this is not a law initiative, I must clarify, but it's just so interesting that it's worth being raised. It's from a group in Adelaide uh, that is calling for plain packaging toys. 
because they feel that if we have a gender bias, it's because we have colors such as blue and pink, so if we ban colors altogether, we will avoid this gender bias, which is quite interesting to see how broad the scope of things could get, not only from the so-called sin industries that could be fatty foods or alcohol or sugary drinks, et cetera, et cetera, as the public health advocates call for, but it could go as broad as infant formula, toys, you name it. So coming back to this brand finance report, they, they, they got interested in this movement and all these different calls, and they made evaluation of basically these companies that you see here, which are key leading global brands of fast-moving consumer goods. Basically, from the total of these brands, 900 of, 9, from 1,242, 907 of them, meaning 73%, will be affected if plain packaging will be introduced. <coughs> How much will they lose? So that's the interesting part of the analysis that Brand Finance is. It was actually to put numbers into this translation into other policies. And as a result, the loss will be 187 billion in losses from market, which is tremendous. And basically, you can see here as well the loss of enterprise value before this, this policy is introduced and afterwards. From the evaluation of the different companies that was there, in absolute terms, Coca-Cola would be the most affected one, with a loss of 47 billion. So this quantification is very interesting, just to have a, a, an initial thinking of how bad this could be and how, de how destructive it could be of global brands. And um, this, this report, by the way, it's available, it's publicly available. Uh, I'm happy to share it. Otherwise, you just Google uh, brand finance plain packaging and you will find it there. But it's a very interesting read to realize the impact that this policy has. And then just, just to finalize on one thought is that, well, of course, <coughs> This has been raised in many different uh, legal fora, uh, including uh, the World Trade Organization, which was the first case on plain packaging policy brought together by four countries against Australia. Long story short, this was a huge um, case. 36 uh, states, uh, countries joined this as a third party, and the result was as potentially predicted that the World Trade Organization failed in favor of Australia saying that plain packaging policy does not violate WTO rules, specifically TRIPS and TBT agreements. The result for this is that the way the WTO reasons in terms of their panels and the appellate body is that they set a, set a type of precedent already. So another panel arises with similar type of dispute, they will have to fail on the same perspective. Now, this dispute is being appealed currently. Um, we don't know what the outcome will be, um, but could be that potentially the appellate body will reverse it. Potentially not so likely, we don't know. Uh, we're expecting to see the results at some point, but now with the issue of appointing judges in the appellate body will might take a bit longer. But overall, the message I want to give you is that in the end, if you deprive one industry sector of their intellectual property, all the industry sectors eventually, and brand owners, will eventually lose. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Cynthia, also for presenting those numbers. Um, Jared will be next. Jared from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in charge of IP um, department. And Jared, will you use your presentation, or will you just talk? I'll just talk, I think. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. Hi, <laughs> everyone. Yours. Thanks, Barbara. Um, as Barbara mentioned, my name is Jared with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. I know I, many of you already know me, um, and I know many of you probably are familiar with the chamber. But for anyone who's not, um, the chambers of commerce in the U.S. tend to be a little bit different than those here in Europe. Um, we are a fully private sector organization unaffiliated with the U.S. government, and we're actually the, um, the largest business advocacy group um, in the world with about uh, three million um, individual businesses that we represent uh, of all shapes and sizes across all industry sectors. Um, so I'm just here to give <clears throat> just a few quick thoughts on um, why IP is so important to the business community that, that we represent. Um, First of all, in the U.S., um, it's a, a fun, considered a, a fundamental property right um, enshrined in our Constitution by our founding fathers. Um, and they actually borrowed their first concepts of IP from British common law uh, before that. So we, we view it as originally a, a European concept. Um, 
And we believe that it's every bit as worthy of protection um, as physical property. When you think of you know, property, what could be more yours than the fruits of your own intellectual labor? Um, it's also a driver of innovation and creativity. When you think of medicine, technology, film, music, fashion, all these diverse industries <clears throat> share um, a common uh, reliance on intellectual property for their viability. Um, we estimate that in the US today, um, something like 45 million jobs um, directly depend on intellectual property, and there's, the figure is similar here in Europe as well. Um, as Cynthia mentioned, it also protects consumers uh, with brands, enabling them to make educated decisions um, about the, the quality and reliability of the purchases they make. Um, and I also wanted to let you know about um, our signature research, research product, um, every year we produce um, an, a global uh, intellectual property index. Uh, we've been doing this since uh, 2012. Um, <clears throat> we really recognized that there wasn't um, an objective uh, research piece out there that took a look holistically at, at the major economies in the world and, their, and, and compared their individual IP environments to one another. Um, so we stepped in to do that beginning in, in 2012. Um, the first year we did it with 11 countries and it caused a big stir. Um, it was sort of viewed as a, a name and shame document by some of the bad actors in the world on IP like China. In fact, um, the Chinese vice premier, I believe, um, was scheduled to visit DC um, the week after we released the first report and they called us um, and we had shared it with them in advance and they called us and said he was going to cancel his state visit if we released it, um, which we did anyway and he ended up coming anyway, so that worked out. Um, <clears throat> but it's really evolved uh, since 2012. Um, the, the index we released um, two months or so ago um, now covers uh, 50 major global economies representing about 90% um, of GDP. and. It's also come a long way in the way it's perceived. Um, so it's really intended not to be a name and shame document, but to be a policy roadmap um, for policymakers around the world, sort of you know expressing the views um, of the world's largest business association um, who've worked with our members to identify what's most important to them as they look to make investment decisions in markets around the world. Um, <clears throat> so we really intended to be a helpful tool, and I have copies here to, to share with you. Um, one of the most interesting um, parts of the index is um, an annex that we do. It's a statistical analysis um, that draws various co uh, correlations between um, countries that improve their scores on the index and associated uh, social and economic benefits. I mean, just to rattle off a few, um, um, some of the benefits of improving IP protection. Um, uh, countries with stronger IP environments are about 26% uh, more competitive. They are about 30% more likely to attract venture capital and private equity funds, uh, almost 40% more likely to attract uh, foreign investment. So there's some really clear evidence coming out of the index um, as the result of our research um, that demonstrates some pretty profound social and economic benefits uh, to countries that adapt um, stronger IP environments. Um, so I'm happy to share it with all of you, and I hope um, as you um, look at your own IP laws in your own countries and around the world, you, it'll be a, a useful tool to you. Um, and with that, I guess I'll turn it back to Barbara. Well, thank you, Jared. And David Williams will be speaking on behalf of the Taxpayers Protection Alliance. So he will bring in also a little bit of consumer uh, advocacy, I hope. <laughs> Uh, and uh, then we will open, um, actually Rolf will open the floor and uh, for Q&A and okay. debate. How do I open it? Good afternoon and, and thank you. And first, uh, Barbara, I was at the first European Resource Bank in Borovets. Yes. We were bowling in the basement of the hotel. Remember that? Yes. Yeah. That was... So again, thank you, and I want to talk about how IGOs run uh, roughshod over your IP, and this is all at taxpayer expense. So I want to take a little bit of a different approach to this, because we know how important IP is, but let's talk about some of these IGOs and just the role they have in destroying IP and disrespecting IP. So IGO, International Governmental Organization, uh, global bureaucracies that basically run your life. Actually, it should be ruin your life. Maybe that's a typo. Ruin your life, 
take taxpayer funding but completely unaccountable. Waste and mission creep and disrespect and destroy IP. So we're at a university. I was really tempted to print this up, pass it around and have a pop quiz and see if you could identify these different IGOs. Now, many years ago, I was in grad school and the professor handed out a map of Africa with all of the countries outlined but none of the names. And he said, fill this in. The guy next to me did it in 10 minutes. He got Burkina Faso correct. He, got, he was like this savant. And here I am with maybe one or two countries filled in. So I get a little bit of a flashback when I ask people to, to take a test like this. But, but seriously, these are some of the leading and most destructive IGOs that we have. The United Nations, the World Health Organization, the EU, the ILO, International Monetary Fund. Don't bash the YouTube. This is not fair. <laughs> but it's so much fun. <laughs> so let's talk about the World Intellectual Property Organization. This is supposed to promote the protection of intellectual property. Not exactly. So a former deputy director said they abuse their authority and send IP to dictators. Now look at this. They sent computers and a printer, so North Korea now has one printer, to, to North Korea at taxpayer expense. Now what's significant about this, look at the, the line underneath that, is that now North Korea can be shifting their hacking efforts to intellectual property theft. So you have taxpayer money going to a dictator that could potentially lead to IP theft. And here's kind of an interesting uh, chart of who's using uh, WIPO. And obviously this allows companies to obtain recognition of their patents. And you see the US actually has dipped in their use of this uh, system. China has increased. So WIPO officials are saying, you know China, what you're doing is absolutely fine. And what's, what's interesting about China, and may, many of you may not know this, is that they're creating IP courts a whole IP court system, which is bizarre considering the abuses they've had in the past. So here's just a few examples. Uh, one in five corporations say, says China has stolen their IP within the last year. Now, Bill Gates was asked about his Windows operating system in China. And he says, I have good news and bad news. The good news is a billion people are using Windows. The bad news? I sold one copy. So obviously, China has an IP problem. So who else will protect IP? Kind of a play on words, World Health Organization. So UN agencies regularly, on a regular basis, undermine IP. Plain packaging. We heard about tobacco. We're going to have alcohol. We're going to have sugar, fast food, baby formula, toys. I mean, it's getting out of control. Now the World Health Organization receives a lot of money and they're supposed to address global health issues. So a couple years ago they went into Syria to try to adopt plain packaging of tobacco. It, not the chemical weapons, not the uh, human rights abuses, it was about plain packaging. I don't smoke, but if my country is being bombed, I might have a cigarette. I may, after a long day of being bombed, have a cigarette to unwind and relax. But no, it would have to be in a plain package tobacco. And yes, that's a picture of ISIS. I don't know why my director of policy put that there. He just, uh, he just wanted to, to add that. So compulsory licensing. Uh, we heard a little bit about this earlier. And a few things I want to point out about this. Uh, obviously, we know what compulsory licensing is. Um, now, they say it's a practical way of preventing the abuse of patent rights. Now, when Indonesia sees international patents for seven HIV, AIDS, and hepatitis B medicines in 2012 in violation of WTO, WHO and WIPO did nothing. They sat by as observers. I mean, here you're talking about critical medicine going to a continent, and they just uh, look the other way. Unidade, this is another IGO 
that is funded by airline taxes. You ever notice that airline taxes are the really easy thing to do? Because they want to clean up the environment with airline taxes, they want to fund drugs with airline taxes. It's, uh, it's amazing. And basically, this is just a lawyer's collective to uh, challenge patent rights. Again, the organization forced HIV drug manufacturers to withdraw their patent applications in India, hurting the million of Indians suffering from HIV. And of course, what's, you, know, you can't have a good scandal without the Clintons. The Clinton Foundation received half a billion dollars from Unidaid, used the money to give AIDS patients diluted drugs. They sent these drugs to Africa. They were diluted. They didn't work. And this is all being funded with taxpayer money. So I probably should have had this slide first. It's about Unidate. But this is the, uh, I think it really gets to who they think they are and what they should be doing. So I'm just going to read a couple sentences. But while patents can incentivize innovation, they also limit competition that could stabilize supply and or reduce prices. Limit competition. It's because of strong IP that we have better drugs. It's because of strong IP that we may have these new breakthroughs in gene therapy where you can actually cure patients of diseases. And it says intellectual property barriers can be the cause of some of these barriers to access. Again, this is the fundamental difference of a philosophy that we have, is that they think IP is a barrier. IP is not a barrier. It opens up the markets. So just real quickly, I want to point this uh, at what uh, Unidate does. And are you familiar with the game show Jeopardy? Where you start with the answer, and then you come up with a question? So this is what they do. They say, OK, we want compulsory licensing. We want to take away IP. So now we're going to start at the beginning and go through this process. So Alex Trebek would be proud of what Unidate is doing when it comes to compulsory licensing. Strong IP is good medicine. And you know, I was uh, looking at the, uh, your list, uh, Jared, and I was like, let's look at pharmaceuticals and let's look at uh, the companies that are the strongest in IP. Isn't that interesting? The top five pharmaceutical manufacturers and the top five GIPC countries are very similar, aren't they? And I'm glad we have a strong German contingent in the room because Germany is a number one pharmaceutical and number five GIPC, so good job, Germany. So what's the point here? So the Taxpayers Protection Alliance, we're a taxpayer group. We do a lot in intellectual property because it affects the economy, it affects revenue, it affects uh, taxpayers on every level. So what we want to do and what we have done is create IGO Watch, is we are joining with other groups to monitor these organizations, to look at the EU, the uh, UN, you name it. And what we're using, you know, letters, public comments, op-eds, and Australia was briefly mentioned in plain packaging. Cynthia briefly mentioned Australia. Look at what's happening in that country. Smoking rates are going up. Illicit trade is going up. Revenue is going down to the government because of plain packaging. It was instituted in 2012. And if you know Sinclair Davidson from Australia, he has brilliant presentations on what is happening in Australia because plain packaging does not stop people from smoking. So Australia is the canary in the coal mine. So we have a uh, research associate, Marco Horg. Please, if you want to be a part of this, uh, this effort, please reach out to me, reach out to him. Here are some of the groups that are already a part of this. So I think we have 25 groups in 14 countries. Some more. Please get involved in one more. Finally, if we don't hold them accountable, who will? This is billions of dollars of taxpayer money going to undermine and destroy IP. Thank you. Thank you, David. <clears throat> Before we get in the discussion, perhaps I want to contribute some, some remarks out of the view of, the, of, of Germany. You, you were talking about our medicine uh, success and 
We have a big discussion in Germany about uh, promotioning uh, and, and protecting uh, uh, knowledge and intellectual property. It's in, in, in we, we get less and less patents in Germany. That's that's not very usual because because we were one of the of the first countries, as you remarked it already, less and less patents, and it takes us more and more time to bring them through the bureaucracy. The second uh, the second thing is uh, we have to fight the bureaucracy for for getting the patents. But the first the first uh, the first part. That it's it's reduced. It's it's uh, responsible that you cannot save your knowledge. That's that's a big problem for 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 intelligent people. They they are not the best uh, the best fighters. And and if you know how to how much you must spend only for keeping your patents, that's that's a really big problem. And I I give you the example we uh, in, in for for cancer of children in Germany. We reduced it in 30 years from, in, 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 in 30 years ago, 90% of children, they died of, of the cancer. In, and, and today it's about 15% and, um, and they, they think that they can reduce it to 5 to 10%. But it takes much money. And we were, we were discussing already today how, how expensive medicine is. The development of, of medicine is very very expensive, and if you if you can keep it for 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 longer time uh, in, in in your own uh, in your own economy, then nobody will make these research in, 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 the, in the researchers in the future, and because it's it's too it's too expensive. So we have the discussion in Germany. Uh, uh, for, for, for more patents, we, we discuss tax reductions, incentives, tax credits that uh, that um, to, 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 to help the companies to development. That's the one thing. And for the protection, we have another problem because in Germany, I can explain it also with, a, with an example. One of the biggest uh, one of the biggest robber, robot uh, producers, KUKA, was bought by a Chinese company. And it was a big discussion if we can give it out, and because it was already the tenth or the or the fifteenth big uh, uh, company which was sold to Chinese. If you see the market of the last years after selling this roboter company to the Chinese, the roboter market was growing 72 percent, but the export of of the German roboter company of KUKA to China was reduced at, uh, for 5%. So, so they took over the knowledge, they produce it in their country, and they don't buy it in Germany. So we, have the, so we have the discussion in Germany how to protect our companies to, uh, to, uh, to, get, uh, to get bought by, by, by Chinese, by Chinese com uh, companies, because if you, if you leave it as it is, then we have to discuss this now. Should we protect the knowledge in our in our countries, or should we leave it to the free market? But if you leave it to the free market, at the end the riches takes it over, and the riches are not the Germans and are not the, the United <laughs> States at the time. The riches, what? Yeah, yeah. The, the riches are the Chinese. So, so we have we have to discuss seriously what to do. What to do? I'm no, no I'm, I don't like uh, protectionism myself but but how to how to solve this problem on the one hand to uh, to to get uh, to get uh, to uh, get all the, the the return of of investment for for researchers on the one hand that's that's a big problem and how to how to keep the companies and 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 the and the workers in our country so that we should discuss how to make this in the future who starts Jared? We're going to go to questions. Yeah. Or questions. questions, if you like. Hi, once again, Mo May Wright. Just uh, to go to David Williams and, and your presentation on IGOs um, and to sort of cut back to some of the, the themes that were discussed earlier and just now. 
Uh, one of the things that drives me nuts about AGO, IGOs, uh, I don't really use that term, but is that there is sometimes, and I would say most times, no authorship to the reports that are prepared. And I think uh, I, I'm working on a current issue right now where in 2017 the W Health, the World Health Organization adopted a, a resolution on cancer control. It's a five-page resolution and you know on page four, paragraph 29, subsection two, it says that we need to look at cancer medicines availability and, and access. And one of the first reports to come out of that resolution back to the WHO is, of course, on cancer medicine prices. And it's almost 200 pages, but you don't see anything else related to the resolution from, a, from just last year. So that's going to be presented this, at this WHA in, in a month or a month and a half. So, but, I, but I wanted to just ask about that. Is there any way we can get them to tell us who prepares our reports? Because it, it turns out to be very biased in terms of the information. So two, uh, two quick comments. First of all, the WHO is obsessed with cancer and not in a good way because they come out with reports saying that uh, carrots, aloe vera, bacon, uh, coffee causes cancer. So, and this is done, and it gets to your, to your second point, is that you have people like Michael Bloomberg that are funding some of this work and some of this research at the World Health Organization that we just don't know about because they are allowed, Bloomberg has done this, at, at least with the World Bank, is that he puts out reports, World Bank letterhead, all the trappings of the World Bank, at the very end, the footnote in four-point font says this is not a World Bank publication, this is done by Michael Bloomberg. So he has so much influence in the World Health Organization and uh, the World Bank and the UN. So I think that's what we really need to get to is exposing who is really behind this and who's funding, besides the taxpayers, but who's funding this you know, silly science that's coming out of, uh, I mean, they said that bacon is just as bad as plutonium to cause cancer. I mean, this is what the, the World Health Organization says. That's great. David, um, another question. Um, we were discussing, um, because one of our members economics and is Philip Morris. And um, say, have a very nice innovation, ICOS. So, but in the U.S. market, I, I, can't, I cannot understand. So for sure, if we do, if we, just, we know if you smoke, you have a risk of cancer. So normally we should uh, not allow to smoke, but we love the tax in Germany, 14 billion plus VAT on it. So that's the reason why it's not forbidden, because it's a cash cow for Germany. But we cannot replace it. Um, you're not allowed to, to invent this product. There's no innovation anymore, and I cannot understand it. So because it, it's, it's so crazy. And the second question, transparency. We have a problem in Brussels too, uh, not only IGO. We have a big problem with NGOs. Yes. And, and we say publish, they take part in these negotiations, and we need transparency because these good us, they want to educate people. That's with the health cancer and the green movement. And we, we, are, we are really too weak if we do not, if we do not uh, how to say, convince people to look in the backside to transparency financing of these groups. So quickly about ICOS and these harm reduction products is that for 20 years, my father smoked three and a half packs of cigarettes a day. That's a lot of cigarettes over a long amount of time. And, and obviously he's not with us anymore after smoking three and a half packs of cigarettes for 20 years. I wish ICOS or e-cigarettes or vaping was available in the 70s or 80s. And you have governments that are preventing this new technology. These, and Paul Blair from HCR will talk about this tomorrow in greater detail, but we have the US government, we have the World Health Organization that is denying, and they, d denying the benefit of an e-cigarette versus a traditional cigarette. So it's because tobacco companies are producing these products, they still don't like it. And as far as the NGOs go, Michael, they are getting taxpayer money too. So there's a whole system of NGOs that are receiving taxpayer money. That's why you can't trust
trust what you know the reports that they're coming out with because they're not going to slam the the organization that's giving them money. So NGOs are a, a massive problem. Just, just to add, this fair tax movement, for instance, commission pays them that say make a research that you have an output that what the commission wants uh, that. Uh, tax competition is harmful. It's, it's crazy. So, say finance, European Commission is financing these NGOs, and it's, I think it should not be allowed. Well, and that's why we started this IGO Watch, is that we want to expose some of this, and we want to do it on a global basis and have other organizations help us. So that's why we're doing this, is to expose some of what's happening. It's, it's also my understanding that the WHO through their conflict of interest um, policies, don't allow any sort of communications with companies at all. And so they've basically frozen out companies to come in and make their case and provide any information. And they rely all on the NGOs who have open access and groups like uh, the Bloomberg Foundation. Uh, my question actually was to Cynthia. Um, it's my understanding that uh, Chile uh, is perhaps the leader in the, the plain packaging um, movement, if you will. That there are in, 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 in food grocery stores entire aisles that have nothing but plain packaged uh, uh, foods. Have, has there been any research done on what that has, what impact that has had on uh, company profits, uh, the value of their products? Um, uh, any sort of documentation on, on what impact this has had uh, overall, whether it's had an economic impact, how it's changed uh, behavior. Um, what do we know about this? It's been going on for some time. Yes, thank, thank you for the question. So yes, Chile is one of the countries that is leading on this cause. Um, I think one that was leading even more is Uruguay. Uh, because the president himself, Tabay Vasquez, was really looking to promote himself at international arenas while also talking about Bloomberg, getting a lot of fund funding from Bloomberg Foundation. And they were leading on this movement in terms of trying to combat non-communicable diseases. But in the case of Chile, and you're absolutely right, there is a lot of movement. They started with these stop signs on food, then they start also banning cartoon characters in cereal boxes. Now they ban altogether the surprise kinder because you know it's so attractive with these toys, despite the children cannot buy those. It's the parents who buy them, but anyway, the parents might be too attracted to buy those products. So basically, they are banning a lot. Chile does have an initiative on plain packaging as well. It hasn't been moving so much uh, from a couple of uh, years. I think now from, from the election last year, we haven't heard so much going on. Uh, but in terms of data, this brand finance report does make um, some analysis as well in terms of savory snacks and some of these foods and make some of the comparisons as well in numbers. Specifically for Chile, I'm not aware, but what I do know is in Latin America, there is a lot of concern about this. It's happening in Colombia as well, Mexico, of course, uh, leading with the tax on, on sugary drinks, and which was a big situation for Coca-Cola. And there is a lot of interest as well from these industries. Um, but I think brand finance could be an initial um, intake in terms of data. Okay, so... Um, okay, I'm Wolfgang Müller from Berlin, and there's one question. I'm, if I recall well, there wasn't Germany on the list of the countries in the process of introducing plain packaging. And I have two questions. Number one, no, actually one. Is there a pattern you find why certain countries are in it? Why are they so eager going for it? And why is Germany resistant? Remember, up to this day, we have tobacco advertisements still in limited spaces in Germany, actually on bus stations. So do you see a pattern, I mean, actually, we can draw from? Yes, that, that's a very good question. And actually, Germany is a good example of a, of a balanced approach of regulation. So basically, the smoking rates are not as high as other countries that actually have more stringent type of measures. But in terms of examples, we do see sometimes some liberal economies not going forward with this. Switzerland is another example as well. It was proposed by the private uh, members bill as well, trying to look forward for this. Uh, and basically, the government responded like this is a policy that is just too stringent and is too um, economically uh, damaging that we think there are other measures that could be considered. 
Um, so in the case, for example, of Sweden as well, we had this morning, uh, well, a couple of days also just discussions about the case of Sweden, when they were about to change the constitution as well, just to introduce plain packaging. And in the end, the result was the, the Swedes value much more their constitution and their freedom of expression to change the constitution. So they didn't go forward. Mm -hmm. So I think we can see some sort of pattern in terms of valuing uh, economic freedom, uh, freedom of speech, and not proceeding with this policy. Um, I don't know, there is another joke we, play, we say, uh, because all the countries that introduce playing packaging, they play rugby. And I don't know if there's any connection with that, but um, there, there, there are some thoughts. So, yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> the questions? Jared, I have one question to you. Uh, What's the situation in the United States with the sale out of, of in, uh, what's uh, what's the situation in the United States about the sale out of intellectual property? Is there the same discussion as we have in Germany uh, with 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 all these? Uh, if they buy big companies, they buy only the the intellectual property, and 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 then it's it's lost for the country. Do you have this discussion too in the United States or not with China, for um, example? <clears throat> I mean, I, I invite my other American colleagues to jump in too, but um, you, do you mean the forced technology transfer to, to China and things like that? I mean, that's a, a, a major problem um, with countries doing business internationally. I don't know if that's what you're asking. Do you, get, do you guys know? What? Yeah, I don't, I don't think that – it's not that – I, I don't think the conversation is happening to the degree that it's happening in other countries. Um, you know, being led by by President Trump, uh, we are um, following his agenda, and I think he's talking more about the theft of intellectual property from China rather than the the selling and the buying of American intellectual property. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's quite different. In in, in in Europe, it's it's a real it's 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 getting a real problem. Yes, yes. Yeah. Just want to throw in an anecdote, which almost sounds like uh, uh, devilish from the advocate point of view. Okay, th there is a famous company who does chainsaw stuff and similar work equipment, Stiel, from Baden-Württemberg. Mm. And they basically realized years ago that they basically can't really get their stuff protected. And what they do is having an enormous investment into product development. So basically when you think, oh, they brought out the latest state-of-the-art, really future-proof thing, they already have two more of the same thing in the pipeline, which are even better. So basically you're trying to out-compete the, the, the copycat uh, companies in, in, in China, because they just know. And I mean, I just actually heard the other day from an example which was mind-boggling of how pirated products to what magnitude is. And a, a big Austrian companies that produce these cable car installations for major ski resort. They got a call a while ago from a, comp from a ski resort that we have a serious issue with, your, with the installation with this cable car. And they said, sorry, we never sold you one. So we talk about a many digit million investment of a cable car. Basically, yeah, so it's like the magnitude of, of uh, piracy in this is just, I mean, for the normal people, unbelievable. Well, and I, I would say that a lot of people accept IP theft when they're watching a sporting event on one of these illegal streams, is that they think it's a victimless crime, so they start out with watching uh, soccer, I'm sorry, football, and it moves to something else, so... They, they just don't think, you know, talk about the, you know, Hollywood and the music industry or the uh, film industry is that you have production assistants that are making $40,000 a year. Is that that's who this really affects? Is that, you know, it's not the ones making $10 million, the superstars, it's everyone else, the production crew, that it hurts when these movies are downloaded illegally. Yeah, I would just. Um, yeah, I mean, piracy and counterfeiting are, are major, major challenges, obviously, um, from everything from train cars to um, sort of um, less impressive items, shoes, watches, all that stuff. Basically, if, you, if you're making a product that people want anywhere in the world, someone's going to counterfeit it. And those of us who work in this industry have seen some pretty scary examples, thing, everything from counterfeit 
contact lenses, counterfeit cancer medication, uh, counterfeit airbags in cars, counterfeit brake pads. I mean, you can just imagine some of the consequences of, of things like that. Um, I'd also just note as an aside, that it's estimated that about 84% of all counterfeit hard goods in the world come from China and Hong Kong. Um, so that is where the vast majority of them arise from. And that no other single country is responsible um, for even 1% of the remaining 16. Um, so China and Hong Kong are far and away the, the worst actors on counterfeiting. Um, I also, yeah, I agree. I think there's a big problem, um, and I guess particularly with younger people, but not exclusively, um, when it comes to piracy. Um, you know, people think that because you can't see it and touch it, it should be free. Um, and that's a, a cultural problem that's very difficult to combat. Um, and you know, the, the same person that would steal a movie or a song, uh, you know, which of course is art, would most likely not you know, break into an art gallery at night and steal a painting because they liked it. Um, so it's just it's a it's kind of a tougher message to deliver. We had a uh, big discussion in Germany in, in the newspapers that uh, that uh, in the in the medicine part, they uh, many companies uh, don't uh, develop new medicine because they cannot protect their knowledge, and uh, that's I think that's a that's a real problem because uh, if if they uh, if if uh, if you know it from 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 medicine if if, if it's development it's, it takes much money to develop it it's the price is very high. And, uh, and uh, it takes only a very short time, and then you get the same product uh, with 10% with of, the, of the price which the, the comp company who developed it had to, had to take for it. And so I think that's, that's also, we must think about how to, 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 to keep uh, the, the, the research running. If, if, if you don't protect something, then it's, it's very hard to keep uh, the development running, or you must pay, you must pay it from, from, from taxpayers' money. Yeah. yeah, I mean, pharmaceutical research is a highly risky endeavor. It takes something like um, from, you know, first-stage R&D to getting a product to market, which the vast majority of them never get to market. It takes something like 12 years and an average of, I think, $4.5 billion. Um, and it's in its upper 90s, the percentage that will never make it to market. And of course, the ones that do, the few that do, not only have to pay for themselves, they have to pay for all the R&D that went into the, the vast majority of, of drugs that will never turn a profit at all. Okay, other topics? I've talked to some uh, Trump uh, appointees about the, uh, the pharmaceutical pricing and never, of course, on the record, but off the record, they say, look, we know this isn't good policy, but we're throwing a hand grenade out there because we're tired of American consumers financing all the research and development while the Europeans free ride by getting drugs just a little bit above marginal cost. Uh, and they seem to think that, Matt, that somehow by doing this, this will force up drug prices in Europe uh, and bring down drug prices in the US. Now, I don't work on this issue enough, so I don't particularly know how to respond to that, so I'd be curious to get reactions from somebody. Well, they're playing a game of chicken with <laughs> drug pricing and drugs. They're doing that with uh, tariffs and trade also. So this is just what the administration does. And you know, we have countries that aren't providing uh, medication for AIDS because they there's no innovation, and they can't protect their IP, so they're not, you know, countries are not making these drugs available. It's not that they're not producing them, it's just these countries will not pay for it because they're forced to, uh, you know, pay a certain amount. So it's, uh, it's absolutely destructive, and the Trump administration is, again, it's, that, it's a hand grenade, and it's just, it's not necessary, and uh, it's really going to destroy, you know, drug pricing in the U.S., and unfortunately, I would add, I mean, a likely result, too, is there'll just be less pharmaceutical innovation if, if there's just nobody paying for it. Not that I support the U.S. paying for a bunch of freeloaders, either, but... Other questions? Okay. Thank you very much for an interesting discussion.